our next um, excitement will be Paul Ketrowski and Howard Lindzen will be having an Oxford debate, and I actually will be up here to help moderate. Really quickly, two very uh, experienced uh, international entrepreneurs. Paul advises the Kaufman Foundation as a senior fellow. He's an experienced entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and academic, with also an active uh, angel investing in the verticals of internet, mobile, and life sciences. Howard Lindzen is co-founder and CEO of StockTwits. It's a social network for traders and investors to share real-time ideas and information. He's got more than 20 years' experience in the financial sector and as an entrepreneur and as an investor. Unfortunately, uh, Howard didn't make it here, but he will be via Skype. Uh, Paul, if you come on up here. Um, and we are going to be talking about do we need more entrepreneurs? Howard, are you there? Hello? Oh, we got you, Howard. Fantastic. How are you? Uh, we are good. We're, we miss you here. But uh, Paul is standing right behind me on stage, and I'm going to moderate between you guys um, in the subject of do we need more entrepreneurs. Paul thought it would be good if you could start and give us your perspective of whether or not we need more entrepreneurs. Well, um, we, definitely, we don't need more economists. We, we, we totally need more entrepreneurs. Um, I, I, I think we're, I don't want to get off subject about what, what I feel the difference between as an entrepreneur and a entrepreneur. Um, but, you know, I, I liken entrepreneurship to stock trading in 1999 when uh, doctors and teachers and cab drivers uh, all thought they could learn how to uh, trade stock. So I think today in uh, startup land, you know, with the cost of, of, of capital being so low and, you know, companies like AngelList and Kickstarter and your blogs and social networks out there, uh, the tools like back in 99 with stock trading and never Timer. Seen, but that, that everybody is meant to be an entrepreneur. I think it's noble and admirable, and obviously, um, you know, I think it's great, but I think we've entered a phase where I would talk about the word entrepreneur, and uh, I think people really have to dig down deep and decide do they really want to do this, because there's a lot of other opportunities out there than just being an entrepreneur at all. Is that it? <laughs> can, you, can you hear me, Howard? Yes, sir. How's New York? I'm sitting. I'm sitting in Fred Wilson's office. I have good free uh, bandwidth here. Much better, than, much more better than anywhere else uh, I've seen. Tilt the camera and let's look at his email. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I feel I should point out that. Uh, in fear of actually having a conversation with me in person, Howard wouldn't even come into the country. Oh, look. These got. Oh, it's good. Is it working now? No. Did, it, it expired July 4th, very much like a <laughs> So that's why Howard couldn't make it, because his uh, passport had expired. Did you notice it at the airport, Howard, or before the airport? No. I noticed it uh, on July, I think on July 1st, when I was already in New York, I just randomly had to check my passport from Toronto. Yeah. And um, I think it's funny that the Canadians had it expired on uh, July 4th. Yeah, but it gets even better, just not to completely digress, but then Howard emails me and says his passport, his, his passport's not working, and I give him some suggestions about how he can get it done in 48 hours at the Canadian consulate in New York. And Howard comes up with the bright idea that he can get into Canada using his U.S. green card. <laughs> 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 it, tur it turns out, and this is going to come as a huge shock, that Canada and the U.S. are separate countries, and Canada doesn't recognize U.S. green cards as viable entry permits. I know this is going to come as a surprise to most of you, but nevertheless. <laughs> so, so, Paul, what do you think of this entrepreneur's so, uh, issue? So, I think it's elitist crap to say that you know, we don't want more entrepreneurs, or even to suggest that we, don't, we, don't, that we even know the difference. My whole argument is that and it's the old one, it's the old gangster argument that it takes a lot of dead bodies to fill a swamp and you just don't know how many, so you just keep filling until the swamp is filled. And solving tough problems is, is really about filling swamps. And it's, it's naive of us to think that we have any idea 
what, uh, what, which, which people and what people are going to be able to figure out and best solve the problems that we have in front of us. And in particular, you know, there's great, there's fantastic data out there showing that, and this is Kaufman stuff, but showing that, you know, on a, on a, on a per capita basis, the U.S. is actually declining in terms of the number of entrepreneurs it produces on an annual basis. So the notion that somehow whatever faddish nonsense is happening in a, one narrow sector of IT has any bearing about what's happening in the broader economy in terms of you know, producing excessive numbers of entrepreneurs to the point that we're producing you know, these entrepreneurs is just not borne out by any data that I've ever seen. So as a matter of fact, it's actually going the other way, that there's this great sucking sound from places like Wall Street and elsewhere, pulling out some of the best and the brightest and yanking, I think I talked about this here maybe last year, and pulling them out to do things that are, from a societal standpoint, really counterproductive. And so there's a great line Mike Kinsley, the columnist that the Washington Post has, where he says, you, never, you don't know when you're spending enough until you spend too much, right? You, you can't stop too soon because you need some, capitalism operates on waste. Entrepreneurship is very much the same thing. So my other argument would be that, you know, we want some entrepreneurs. As a matter of fact, I'd like to see a lot more. I wish I was getting more bizarre pitches, and maybe Howard is, so I'll defer to him, but I wish I was getting more bizarre pitches from people who seem completely implausible and, you know, and mad and mostly doing it because they thought it was cool and trendy, because that would reassure me that we're, in the Kinsleyan sense, seeing too much, and, which, and too much is actually, a, you know, a good idea. And why is too much a good idea? Too much is a good idea in part because there's this great, uh, Andy Rapoport, who's at August Capital, has these great numbers. He took some unpaid graduate students at Stanford to show that on an annual basis, there are only about eight companies that matter in Silicon Valley, right? That you, you, in a sense, as an investor, if you look through the great morass of all the companies that get produced every year in Silicon Valley, there's only about eight on an annual basis that go on to any sort of meaningful levels of success, both in terms of, or whether in terms of job creation or exits or anything else. And, which is, you know, I think fairly daunting because it suggests that that's, that's the end of the funnel, right? That's the bottom end of the funnel, those eight companies. So, you know, you want to make this, the top of the funnel as broad as possible. And to make the top of the funnel as broad as possible, you know, we should be doing everything in our power to encourage everyone we know to at least take a shot at this thing because it may turn out that even though they're, you know, completely implausible candidates to be successful entrepreneurs, that they're actually able to be successful. You know, and we've even sort of extended this a little bit in some work that some Kaufman folks have done. It's more like it's not even eight companies a year. It's about eight companies about every five or six years that turn out to matter. And that's in one of the most vibrant startup and entrepreneur producing ecosystems in the world. So it tells you that in most other parts of the country, we should, if anything, be encouraging you know, more completely nonsensical behavior with respect to people trying out this, this magical thing you know, we call entrepreneurship. So you know, the, my sort of core arguments are that you know, we don't know when we're doing enough until we do too much, that the bottom of the funnel tells us that we produce precious few startups that matter anyway. We should be trying to get more stuff into the top of the funnel because it is this kind of dead bodies that fill, fill a swamp. Um, problem, and that fundamentally it is kind of elitist of us to suggest that we, we know and other people don't know whether or not they should be trying to be entrepreneurs. Many of these people, granted, will never be successful at it, but that's not our problem in the end. That's either going to be theirs or it may be our happy problem if they turn out to be successful. Howard? Uh, he wins. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that, you're going you're gonna, to... You're gonna... I hear, that all the time. I hear that all the time from Howard. We're neighbors in San Diego, and you know, we sit down, and we have these conversations, and uh, that's all right, let's just go for sushi. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I'm going to go for falafel today. All I right. I think Paul's making, this is what Paul uh, gets paid to, to, to do this. Paul has a, a, a darn brain and a, loves a good argument, and I, there's no way I don't want to be taken out of context because I think everything, I'm an investor myself. So, um, and, I, and I take responsibility for my own actions, whether I invest money or start a company. So I think everything that Paul's saying is in fact correct. I think the question is, are there too many people that think they are? And again, I don't know if we're at the top of this entrepreneurial cycle. Or just in the inning two or inning three. But I would argue in the world that I live in, and I haven't done the research that Paul has done, and that's great stuff, Paul. But I would argue, based on the flow that I see and the work effort that I see around the same things that have already, in my opinion, be fixed, whether it's real time communication or sharing, etc., uh, I think uh, we have to move people into like like I'm seeing here at Union Square into education and into uh, healthcare. So 
So somehow we've got to get the entrepreneurs, and I would call this around for main experience, people that have this domain experience in the vertical, but also now need entrepreneurs uh, moving down the food chain. It seems like we've solved a lot of problems since 2008, 2009, uh, with respect to capital getting uh, a little more efficient at the fringe, and in terms of capital being allocated by venture capital and angel and uh, what's called super angels. But what we're not seeing is the broken industries that went into 2008 fix themselves. We're starting to see a little bit of uh, activity around biotechs, and, uh, and that's good for us, Paul, in San Diego. We have both Qualcomm, and we have now um, uh, a lot of biotech stocks. So San Diego, uh, obviously, uh, is looking like a potential, uh, you know, boom town. But again, there's that displacement. All the entrepreneurs want to go to Silicon Valley, but as, uh, you know, there's, you know, there's this misallocation of, 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 of talent and capital that's happened. And I think what you end up with are these people that want to be entrepreneurs in the wrong place. So hopefully all that stuff kind of uh, evens out you don't get what you said, where finally everything goes uh, overboard towards this one sector. Does that uh, help at all, Paul? <clears throat> I win. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I totally, I mean, it's uh, hard for me to disagree with. I mean, I, I think maybe the more, a more interesting thing is if there isn't, if there aren't too many entrepreneurs, what is there too much of? Um, and, you know, and it's pretty clear there are too much of a few things. One of my favorite sort of graphs I like to put up trying to talk about this whole sort of entrepreneurship, too many entrepreneurs thing, is if you look at a graph in the United States, of, and I'm somehow drawing this graph with my fingers. Um, if you look at a graph of, uh, of entrepreneurship, uh, sort of company creation rates in the United States on a per capita basis, so startups, and you compare that against the growth on a per capita basis in entrepreneurship programs in the United States, what's actually happened is this, right? As fast as entrepreneurship programs in the United States rise, the number of entrepreneurs in the United States on a per capita basis has declined. So I often suggest when I'm speaking at business schools, the fastest way to produce more entrepreneurs is to end their programs. Um, which gives me just a shitty reception, which is probably like zero surprise. So, you know, I think, and this is maybe in the spirit of trying to spot entrepreneurs or at least slow down the production of them so we can get more, I think one of the things we could productively do is do away with a lot of university-based entrepreneurship programs, especially inside of business schools as opposed to engineering schools. So in the spirit of trying to help Howard make a better argument, um, what do you think of that? Um, the, I, I agree, again, like, Unfortunately, as an entrepreneur, uh, Paul, you know, as a guy who wants to argue with you, you know, incessantly when I can, <laughs> I, think, I think when it comes down to realistically, it's okay not to have an argument, I think. Oh, did I lose you there? No, we still hear you. We, you know, I don't like to arguments for the argument to say, I'm super bullish, right? So I want there to be more entrepreneurs, right? Uh, I want there the uh, more deal flow in front of me. And I want to see more than what you said, five or eight uh, if, uh, huge companies emerge from these things. So I think we can do a better job around that. I think what we're going to need to see are uh, people, you know, um, getting to the right job faster. And so for example, a company like AngelList, a company like AngelList you know, everybody wonders, oh, people how are we going to make money? Uh, why, um, you know, I post my profile on AngelList, why didn't I get funding? But I think the derivative of AngelList, for example, is it's okay that you didn't get funding. This company right here, which is related to your company, is three blocks away, they seven million dollars, and they're hiring. So I think, you know, where I, when I become an entrepreneur, I go, People are going to have to, you know, pin their ears back and say, you know, it's not personal that I didn't raise this money. These angel lists of the world and Kickstarter aren't for any type. They really are there to help the best go faster. And then why don't I just, as a primitive, go work for that company that just raised money? So what I'm excited about, and, uh, and this is good for entrepreneurs and law entrepreneurs, is there's never been more opportunity to kind of pivot into better uh, opportunities that are well-funded, moving in the right direction, uh, etc. And that's what you're going to get to see from an angelist. And, and, and that's why maybe this isn't a bubble and more of just this 
giant thump into the whole uh, undercurrent of you know reform and fixing things uh, that's going on. Uh, well, um, you guys both mentioned that uh, I think we'd all love to see more than eight or nine or if there is that many companies that are truly, uh, you know, very successful big companies. How can we inspire this audience and or the entrepreneurs to, is there some suggestions how we can have more of those big companies or why we don't and how we can uh, inspire and educate other entrepreneurs that want to be entrepreneurs to get there? I mean, well, so I mean, I think the guy who pointed me to that Andy Rapoport study, so in the spirit of full disclosure, I, I didn't find it. It was uh, Mark Andreessen at Andreessen Horowitz. And uh, by the way, this thing keeps going rogue. It turns from like a rainfall collector into like a small animal burrowing into my cheek. Um, <laughs> we so, can still hear you either way. Uh, okay, good. Um, so, anyway, so, so Mark pointed it out to me, and it was one of the, you know, say what you will about what Andreessen Horowitz is doing, you know, I mean, 250 or $300 million fund turned into a $2 billion fund. There's something like 70 or 80 employees now uh, in a single fund, which is all unprecedented. But the spirit of the thing was to try and address the entrepreneur problem in a perverse sort of way, which was that they felt like they had to have a whole soup to nut shop where they could take young entrepreneurs in particular and help them get in, get, help them through the funnel of how do I find people? How do I build a team? How do I get attention? How do I you know, generate PR and have all those people on staff? So the reason why Andreessen Horowitz is r running with, I was saying this last night, I, I think it's 82 people now. I mean, have you ever seen a venture firm with, I, I've never seen one with more than, I think Kleiner Perkins peaked at like 35. So they've got 82 people. The reason why in part is to try and create a new model to deal with exactly this problem. How do we come out with how do we deal with this, this mess of only having eight, eight companies a year that matter and so many people who want to become entrepreneurs? Well, their answer was, is you create a studio system where we coach people all the way along and we create all these virtual resources um, in-house to get them attention from a PR standpoint, to help them recruit and do all these other things. Will it work? I have no idea, but if you want to think about it in a completely self-serving economist kind of way, it's wonderful, it's, 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 it's wonderful that they're willing to spend so much money, so much of other people's money to do this for us. Right? I mean, I have no idea if it's going to pay out or ever generate competitive returns, but think about the generation of entrepreneurs that are getting some of the best training in the marketplace and flowing through a place like Andreessen Horowitz. That's pretty remarkable. So if you think about what has to happen to take some of these you know, entrepreneurs and others and drive them through the top of this funnel all the way down to this eight or even if it's eight a year or eight over four or five years, that's what has to happen. You've got to get more people in the top of the funnel and you've got to make sure that more of these people as they traverse the funnel don't have such a high die-off rate. Because right now, one of the problems is this very high die-off rate, and the way you deal with that is by dealing with the problems. It's not capital, it's, it's, it's about their ability to figure out how to put together a team, get attention for what they're doing, iterate a product. These are the problems, right? And those are the things you only learn through sort of, you know, horrific experiences. You know, Howard can testify to, and you know, well, he's got direct experience right now running stock twists. You're going through this iterative process right now, right? So. Yep, I think, I think, uh, What's so exciting, obviously, and what at the same time uh, is such a bummer, is that these entrepreneurs, or these people that might be willing, are going to get lost at the top of the funnel because you know there can only be one Mark Andreessen, there's only right. one Y Combinator, there's only one Techstar, there's so many, so many people willing to mentor. Um, so these are all like one of the reasons I get so excited and bullish is because I do see, uh, you know, like what you're saying. I mean, the breaking the mold in Jason Hart, there are no rules. Uh, Zynga had no rules. Groupon had no rules. Anything you told them they couldn't do, they, you know, they just did. Uh, for right or for wrong, we'll find out long term. But, um, you know, we've gone through this phase right now where Groupon, Zynga, Facebook, Twitter, uh, you know, unprecedented growth. So what's great about that in the aftermath of that are all these people that these companies are going to release into the ecosystem that have way more knowledge of going fast. Uh, you know, like McDonald's. It took them forever to get into China, but a company like Chipotle will be able to take people from McDonald's that may have spent 10 years working on getting into China and be able to do that for Chipotle in six months. So again, it's about uh, these systems in place to leverage knowledge and acceleration. You know, in the 80s and 90s, I grew up uh, in Phoenix, in Apollo, you know, to drive um, 
all these universities started uh, basically just handing out degrees. And now we're, you know, tech startups like Combinator the world, where you may not get a degree, and you may only have spent three or four months uh, going through an incubator, but you've got a lot more hands-on knowledge about being an entrepreneur than you did uh, if you went to uh, DeVry or uh, University of Phoenix. So those are all bright spots in the, in the lens of entrepreneuring and entrepreneuring. Uh, I wish you could go faster, and I wish it was scalable, but we're limited by the fact that because there are so few great companies that churn out all these, these knowledgeable employees that want to go start their other things, there's only so far you can push. So I guess what people will mind in the next five years is how far really and Recent and Y Combinator really could push it. But I'm rooting for them. Yeah, so I mean, there's, so there's two key points there. There's one on the venture side and, and mentoring the funnel from a portfolio, venture capital portfolio. Another is um, the mentoring across international to other, other entrepreneurs. I mean, just recently I was in Santiago, Chile, Buenos Aires, Zagreb, and your comment of they are really hungry to leverage either one of these or other ways to succeed. And there's just not enough people in all these different places. They can't all just go to Silicon Valley. Right. But are there other ways? I mean, so some of these incubators are working and everybody's asking me nonstop. I'm sure you guys, which one do you apply to? How do you do it? Um, and one of the biggest questions, do I have to move to New York? Do I have to move to Silicon Valley? Yeah. Um, do you guys, I mean, in order to get to that next level and have more of these big companies, they, uh, there are so many entrepreneurs, but they need that guidance. Should they go across the world or should they build businesses in their backyard? I mean, my, my rule of thumb is, and this is a really crappy thing to say, is if you, can get a, if you can get a YC spot and you get offered anything else, take the YC spot, right? I mean, right. leave. <laughs> Go. I mean, there's that sort of an easy decision, right? I mean, it's, there's a great, I saw a paper recently put out by somebody who was looking at all of these uh, accelerator programs around the United States, of which there are now like, you know, three or four million maybe. Um, <laughs> I, think it's like, I think it's 300. It's I think true. it's like 300 programs. And all of the value add, as measured by job creation and subsequent capital raised, it's like 95% like of, the, of the value add was four groups. Four groups out of 300. I mean, you want to talk about entrepreneurs, we've got entrepreneur -accel accelerators, right? We have way, way too many as measured by their value add. So the first answer is, is absolutely, you're going to have to move to New York, or you're going to have to move to Boston or Boulder or San Francisco or wherever else if you can get that position. But most people can't, and that's the difference now is that the world's flattened enough that you can get attention anywhere. So build something and execute a bit, and some of those rules begin to break, right? You can get, you can get attention almost anywhere in the world. And so, you know, the, the fundamental problem that region, regional arbitrage in venture capital has never worked, right? It, there's a reason why deals in Kansas City are cheap and deals in San Francisco are as expensive. It's because generally speaking, the deals in Kansas City are shitty. Um, so the great people all go to the great centers and compete and you get great markets and you get great deals. I mean, it's, it's, it's ugly and people hate it and they wish it was different. They want it to happen where they are. But that's just the way the world works. Good people gravitate to good people because they want to compete and recruit from each other and learn from each other. And that's all okay. The difference now is that it doesn't mean you can't succeed anywhere else. It may be harder succeeding in other places, but you can still succeed in all those other places. Well, New York is a perfect example. Yeah, I mean, years yeah, ago, yeah. There, there was not that ecosystem, and it's not as big as Silicon Valley, but it's surpassed Boston. Yeah. I mean, so these things grow, you have... Uh, yeah, and Seattle's fallen off and, the map. I exactly. mean, whatever happened to those guys, right? Well, I that's mean, a, it's, that's it's not even a really, a, it's not truly the kind of hotbed center it was even, you know, eight years ago. So these things do rise and fall. Right. Howard, do you want to add something? I also got a mic here that I can ask questions to the audience. Uh, but, I, but if you want to add something before you forget your thought. <laughs> uh, you know, what I would add is, um, you know, I went from Toronto, Phoenix, to uh, San Diego. Um, I can't you say that the hotbed is hard up. And I've been doing this for 20 years and leaving cities behind. So I think there's a million ways to skin a cat. I think as Paul says, if you get the diploma or if you get the offer from my commentator, it's like getting an offer from Harvard right now, uh, you have to go. You have to go and then you're going to have to work harder than you would at, a, at an incubator in Kansas City because you're going to be up against uh, more competitive people. So that helps people learn. I mean, it is what it is, like Paul said. But it doesn't mean uh, you can't think it anymore. Um, and, and, you know, I think there's examples in every city 
And, you know, real estate's cheap, an app is stolen in every city, Wi-Fi costs you nothing. So, uh, and, you know, all the, all the things that you had to do to start a business in the early 2000s with telephone <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, uh, labor costs and uh, office costs have dropped to the bone. So basically, 80 to 90 percent of startup costs have been ripped out. So that means you've got to invest in travel as a bigger part of your startup six months or first year budget. You know, that's where the shift of, of being a true entrepreneur happens. You've got to look at the trends and say, okay, uh, you know, I live in San Diego or I live in Phoenix. That just means three days a week I've got to be in New York and, 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 and uh, San Francisco and I've got to work that part into my budget. Uh, of my startup. So it's a little extra cost of San Francisco. Then again, your life cost will be lower there. So I think I'm, I'm for sure in agreement with what Paul's saying, you know, it is what it is. Uh, you can't complain about it. Uh, that's what Twitter's for right now. <laughs> but in the real world, you just got to go solve these problems and, and, and allocate resources appropriately and your time. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Guys in the audience, any questions? Hang on a second. Is this mic on now? It is on now. Question. So, um, Howard and Paul, usually when we talk about job creation outside of Twitter, it's about politicians, yeah. right? Is there any kind of policy or initiative you could think of that the government could use on either federal or state level that would help uh, broaden the, the top of the funnel? to help get more entrepreneurs into it? So, yeah, I mean, I'm t talking my, one of my books, <laughs> so it, which is the Startup Visa Act. So, you know, as, at Kaufman and with a group of venture capitalists, Brad Feld, myself, others, Fred, I think, Howard, you weren't part of this as well, I think, at one point. So the Startup Visa Program, the idea is, is that, you know, something like 40% of all startups in Silicon Valley have either as a founder or as a member of the core team an immigrant, a recent immigrant to the United States. It's a remarkable statistic. And, the Startup Visa Program is an attempt to really broaden the top of the funnel by saying, for example, if you come to the United States and you do a degree in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics at any level, you get stapled to your diploma a visa that allows you to stay in this country and work and create, and create jobs, create companies. You don't have to be an employee of someone else. You can create something. And we're added to that the idea of you raise a modest amount of money. You can do the same thing. So I think the, the easiest policy prescription, because politicians always want to gravitate to creating pools of venture capital, because you know, VCs are lovely people with firm handshakes and so well-groomed and they want to give them money because we all want to give them money. Um, but the, the, the better solution is this kind of you know, grassroots, let's just get more bodies in to help fill the swamp. And the way we do that is through immigration because that's the way we've always done it, whether it's the United States, Canada, or any developed economy. And so that's the number one policy prescription that I push for relentlessly and shout even louder when they start talking about more venture money or anything else. 100% uh, or agreement there, 100%. Okay, I got a question up here. Hi, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the correlation between university programs and entrepreneurs <laughs> and maybe go into a little bit more detail there? Thank you. What, you don't want just a glib factoid? Kind of. <laughs> so, I mean, literally the relationship existed, exists and has existed for some time that there's been a remarkable rise in entrepreneurship programs in business schools in the United States. It is truly up and to the right however measured, and a remarkable decline in the per capita rate of startup creation in the United States. And so, is it causal? I doubt it. So I, I don't want to, you know, please, if this was a room full of business school deans, I would say the exact opposite because it's much more fun. But among us, just let's keep it in this room. I doubt it's causal, but let's at least say that it's not obviously helpful. Right? There's this rocket ride of entrepreneurship programs in the United States has not, has not stopped the bleeding in terms of the per capita rate of company creation. You could argue that, well, it would have been worse. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> That's some sort of cold comfort, isn't it? That by you know, ramping up the rate of uh, the, all of these entrepreneurship programs, we can create a couple more companies. So my point is just not so much that it's actively causal, it just hasn't been particularly helpful and no one wants to talk about it. Okay, well, we're out of time, guys. Paul, Howard, thank you very much. Um, thank you, audience. And we've got some... See you, Howard. Uh, thank you, sorry. <laughs>